Coming up this week, Tesla releases a huge holiday software update. There's a massive lithium supply right here in North America. Canada's Project Aero is taking shape and much more. Hello friends and welcome to episode 91 of the EV Resource Podcast. I'm Zach Hurst and each week I bring you the latest EV news, information and answer your questions about electric vehicles. Before we get started with the news this week, I want to thank our podcast partner Titan Auto and Tire in Mosley, Virginia for their support. Titan is one of the very few independent shops in Central Virginia that are qualified to work on EVs and from hybrids to Hummers, they fix everything. For more information and to schedule an appointment for your vehicle, go to TitanAutoTire.com. That's TitanAutoTire.com. First off, we'll start with the Tesla news, but not the holiday update just yet. First, some news that Tesla has applied to install supercharger stations in Texas with a CCS combo plug. The Texas Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Program is a program that uses the settlement from the Dieselgate scandal to fund projects to help the air quality in Texas, including funding electric vehicle charging stations. Over the last month, the program has been accepting applications for grants on new charging stations. According to the filing, Tesla has applied for grants ranging from $375,000 to $500,000 on four different new supercharging stations. Now, the interesting thing about these grants is they have the requirement for at least one CHAdeMO and one CCS connector to be installed for a station receiving a grant. The grants say that if alternative connectors will be included in the application, there must be at least one CHAdeMO and or one CCS charging protocol connector for each alternative connector included in the application. This would be significant for Tesla since the automaker so far has only been using its own proprietary connector at supercharger stations in North America. So now as Tesla moves to open its supercharger network to other automakers for the first time starting in Europe, it looks like they might be installing new superchargers with one plug being their Tesla proprietary plug and then also, in this case, most likely a CCS plug versus the Chatamo. Chatamo is kind of a dying charging standard. And now on to the holiday update. Tesla owners around the world were elated as they woke up Friday morning to a notification that software version 2021.44.25.2, or better known as the holiday update, was ready to be downloaded and installed. And I, with the Model 3, was also included in the mix, so I wanted to share some of the bigger features with you, like the light show and others. And the light show is possibly one of the more exciting features of the update. Previously, the Model X was the only Tesla that could do a light show, and now all Teslas have that ability. And it's very simple to use. Just select start the show, exit the car, make sure all the doors are closed, and every light on the car will then engage in a show that is choreographed to music. And I think the best part about this is that Tesla has given us the ability to program our own light shows and upload it directly to the car via a portable USB hard drive. I have some plans for my own creation, and as soon as I figure out how to use the X Lights program, I will, of course, share whatever my creation would be with all of you. As for the other main points to the update, Tesla released a blog entry, and I'll read the features as they've written it. There is a new user interface. Every Model 3 and Model Y, along with legacy Model S and Model X, fitted with an Intel Atom processor, will receive a fresh digital look that carries over design elements from our new generation Model S and Model X. Several notable features include a customizable app launcher, simplified controls menu, and a support for dark mode appearance. There is an updated navigation. The new navigation allows users to hide map details for a clean, simplified look, and you can now add and quickly reorder multiple stops on your route. Your Tesla will automatically update arrival times and battery levels for each destination. So I'm going to pause for a second because this is great. You can now edit the waypoints that was just introduced in uh, a recent update as well, which having the ability to edit a waypoint makes it a lot easier on a trip instead of having to delete everything and start over. 
As for the games, Tesla writes, we've added original Sonic the Hedgehog to Tesla Arcade for even more excitement and a bit of nostalgia during charging stops. You can now also give your brain a workout with Sudoku or challenge your friends with the Battle of Polytopia multiplayer. Now, the Battle of Polytopia was already included on Tesla's software for the games, but it wasn't multiplayer. It was only single player. So now it's multiplayer. I haven't played that game yet. I haven't actually tried to, so I don't know much about it, but I do hear that it's pretty good. Under entertainment, Tesla writes that TikTok is now available on the touchscreen, and our new boombox megaphone allows you to project your voice via your car's external speaker, perfect for announcing to your friends when it's time to load up and head out. And as for audio, for an even better audio experience, there are now five levels of immersive audio, including an auto setting that adapts to the content you're playing, and you can adjust subwoofer output independently to get just the right amount of punch from the bass. And then one of my favorites that I am very happy that Tesla has finally put in is regarding the blind spot camera. Now, when signaling to change lanes or make a turn, a live camera view of the blind spot will activate on the touchscreen. So if you are a Tesla owner, the company wanted to say happy holidays in a big way. And this is just another update that it's worth pointing out is free. These are all free updates. You don't have to pay more for the addition of these features and games. And that is big. I don't know any other manufacturer that is normalizing the continual improvement of their vehicles after delivery to owners without owners having to pay any extra. Honestly, that is one of my favorite things about Tesla as a company. They're not trying to nickel and dime everybody with update after update that you would have to pay for. And it's not like they're just optimizing the the cars. You know, they're not fixing bugs and making little improvements. They are truly giving owners much, much more enjoyment and entertainment and features that have been requested. That isn't something you find anywhere else or Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, honestly, if any other manufacturer is doing this, uh, I'm all for it. I would love to know about it. Next, New Yorkers will be able to visit friends and loved ones around the city in a new fleet of bright yellow Ford Mach-E taxis. This is provided by an EV fleet startup, Gravity Inc., the Mustang Mach-E's were customized with monitors and panoramic roofs for NYC passengers along with AI for driver safety. The fleet represents a new electrified generation of the Big Apple's iconic yellow taxis. Gravity Inc. is an EV startup focused on sustainable fleets and the infrastructure they require to operate. The company's strategy is to bring together best-in-class mobility equipment and integrate software and customer interfaces to support both drivers and passengers. In early next year, Gravity plans to open what it's calling the only true fast-charging site in Manhattan to support its new all-electric yellow taxi fleet. In addition to its EV taxis, Gravity Inc. also partners with building owners and parking operators to implement electric vehicle charging infrastructure that can support individual drivers and also large EV fleets. The Mustang Mach-E, of course, as a vehicle of choice, it's quickly becoming one of the most popular EVs on the current market and has helped Ford become a serious promoter of EV adoption around the globe. And by using the Mach-E with New York City's iconic yellow taxi exterior, Gravity looks to expand sustainable transportation to the most populous city in the U.S. Next, the electric Ducati has arrived, and honestly, we're hearing about it a lot sooner than I had anticipated. Last week, I mentioned that Ducati has confirmed they were testing their new bike for, an up, for the upcoming partnership with Moto E for the season after this coming season. Uh, so that would be 2023. And now we've actually gotten a chance to see the electric bike on track. Its name is still somewhat uh, basic. It's called the V21L electric motorcycle prototype. And it was the result of joint work of the Ducati Corsa team and R&D engineers. And it was taken to the track by Michel Piero, the company's test rider since 2013, and he evaluated the technical characteristics of and potential of the vehicle. 
Piro said that testing the Moto E prototype on the circuit was very exciting because it marks the beginning of a vital chapter of Ducati's history. He said, quote, the bike is light and already has a good balance. Also, the throttle linkage in the first opening phase and the ergonomics are very similar to those of a MotoGP bike. If it weren't for the silence and the fact that on this test we decided to limit the power output to only 70% of the performance, I would have easily imagined I was riding my bike. And by my bike, I'm sure he means the gas-powered one that he's very used to. And some of the most important challenges that are involved in the development of an electric racing motorcycle are primarily related to size, weight, and battery range. Ducati's CEO, Claudio Domenicali, explained that the goal is to make a high-performance, lightweight electric motorcycle that is available to all participants in the Moto E World Cup. The focus of the project is, in addition to, of course, better performance, weight containment, and consistency of power during the race. The technology of batteries, inverters, and electric powertrain are evolving rapidly, and the Italian brand will be at the forefront to develop and be ready for the new era of two-wheeled electric motorsport. And the one thing that they mentioned there that is pretty important is battery performance uh, of power delivery during the race. And that's something that uh, any EV owner can probably tell you is that as the battery gets depleted, your overall voltage, of course, has dropped and you're not going to get the same performance out of uh, a motor or a battery pack as you would when it is completely full. So that's one thing that regarding EV motorsport definitely would need to be addressed. So how often have you all heard the argument against EVs that lithium is rare? I know I've heard it a bunch. Well, it's not true and actually is so far from the truth that it's almost funny. And now we have more information to throw back against false claims like these. California could be at the heart of a new EV revolution across North America thanks to vast reserves of lithium found at the Salton Sea. The 343-square-mile lake was created after the Colorado River flooded in 1905 and is home to huge geothermal deposits of lithium. According to the U.S. Department of Energy, it could generate 600,000 tons of lithium per year, which is more than the U.S. currently needs. Officials have known about the lithium deposits for quite some time, but according to Chief Executive of Controlled Thermal Resources, Rod Caldwell, it hasn't been economically viable to extract it until now. The lithium at Salton Sea is suspended in super hot liquid and is easier to extract than traditional mining. 11 geothermal power plants already operate in the area and take the lithium from the ground while extracting brine for steam production. The lithium is then returned to the ground. So a new facility is being built that will combine a geothermal power plant and a separate lithium extraction site. Controlled Thermal Resources says it could extract 300,000 tons of lithium per year once the site is fully operational. Controlled Thermal Resources, which is a startup to secure the lithium from California, has partnered with General Motors on the project. Battery-grade lithium should be produced by the startup from 2024 onward. Most lithium that's currently used in the automotive industry currently comes from Australia, China, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. Now it looks like we'll start seeing EV batteries containing lithium from right here in North America. And news from our friends in the North has really gotten me excited this week. Most people don't realize that Canada has actually a really large automotive manufacturing sector that is served by hundreds of auto parts suppliers. Canada's Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association represents 90% of all those independent automotive parts manufacturers, which means its members make enough parts to build entire automobiles. And it was that realization that led AMPA, Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association, AMPA, to devise a plan to build an electric SUV almost entirely from Canadian sources, including the battery. The plan is called Project Aero, and it has received financial report from the Canadian government to the tune of nearly $4 million. In an interview, AMPA Chief Technical Officer Fraser Dunn tells Automotive News Canada that Project Arrow is on course, with a reveal planned at the CES show in Las Vegas in early January 2023. 
Concept drawings of the car show it to be larger than a Tesla Model Y and smaller than a Model X. Dunn says the car will be assembled from eight mega stampings that will be laser welded together. It will also feature large magnesium castings for the front and rear frames, an idea, of course, inspired by the Tesla Model Y. The projected sale price of the SUV is between $40,000 and $60,000, but there is more to it. Dunn say the engineers behind Project Arrow are also targeting at least level three autonomy. And rather than relying on battery cells from Asian suppliers like CATL, LG Energy Solution, Panasonic, or SK Innovation, Project Air will be powered by cylindrical cells from Volta Explore, a joint venture between Martin Rea International and Montreal-based graphene firm Nano Explore Incorporated. It will also employ technologies from Ontario Tech University and its Automotive Center of Excellence. So far, more than 400 Canadian companies have expressed interest in taking part in the Project Aero, which expects to have a running prototype on the road in about a year, according to Car Scoops. Okay, and lastly, I had shared with you news in episode... I think it was episode 88, two or three weeks ago, that Christine Dodworth had set a new record in the Tesla Model S Plaid by being the first to run quicker than nine seconds in the quarter mile with a time of 8.994 seconds. Well, recently I had the opportunity to talk with Christine, so I wanted to share that with you now. It is audio only, so if you're watching this on YouTube, just bear with me. Um, I'll probably put up some photos or video of the run. But uh, without further ado, here is the conversation that I had with Christine Dodworth. You are officially uh, considered a world record holder at this point. So I want to get into that. But before we do, you're no stranger to the drag strip. No, no, I'm not. (laughs) This is certainly not your first time uh, running under nine seconds. How did you get involved with drag racing? Where did that come from? What's your uh, origin story, if you will? Um, so my husband actually has always been into drag racing. You know, we've gone to a couple things and, you know, events. Um, and he actually surprised me with a GTR at Texas 2K 18. Surprised me. He's pretty much like, okay, get suited up. You're going to roll a race. <laughs> so, so that's pretty much where it, where it began. I mean, we've, we've done a couple things before that, um, small nothing like big. Um, I did take, uh, we had, do have a, a Porsche Cayenne. Um, we took that down the drag strip once or twice, 12 second, you know, uh-huh. SUV really heavy. Yeah. <laughs> Fast, but, but relatively slow as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and we also done like road race courses. So, um, uh, you know, we did that a little bit, all of that before kids. <laughs> and then once we had, once, you know, we had kids, you know, I took care of them and kind of didn't expect to really get, you know, do something like that again. So, mm-hmm. but he, uh, he surprised me with that in 2018. And ever since then, we've, you know, we've done, we've been doing events together. Yeah, definitely. I mean, definitely a force to be reckoned with. Now, naturally, the GTR doesn't run eight second quarter mile stock, um, but neither does the Plaid. And uh, I believe you are not only the first under nine seconds, but also the only Tesla that has run that quick in the quarter mile at this point. Where did the Plaid come from and, and how did that come to be? So my husband's always wanted a plaid or actually he wanted a Tesla. Uh So he had a P90D that upgraded to a P100D. um, And then when the plaid came out, you know, we got the plaid. It was a no brainer, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, it's, it's it's actually his car. I just happened to drive it that day (laughs) and I got under nine seconds. So you guys did make some changes to the car in order to, to run that quick. I mean, it's still considered stock. I mean, there isn't really much that you can modify with an electric car at this point, unless you're completely custom. But what changes did you guys make in order to get to a point where it would go faster than nine seconds? I mean, it, it honestly really wasn't much. We just pretty much gutted the car. I mean, we took out the seats mm-hmm. um, and we put in a lighter driver's seat. 
and that was the only thing that was in there. Um, and then lighter wheels. <laughs> sure. So weight That's reduction, basically. Pretty much all we did was weight reduction. Yeah. <laughs> that is incredible. And of course, you ran 8.994 at 155 miles an hour. Correct. What is that experience like with the Model S uh, compared to the GTR, which actually runs quicker? I mean, they're very different cars that are both running quite quick. Yeah, they are. They are definitely different. Um, but with the plaid, in a way, you have to like sit there at the light, you know, at the tree for at least 10 seconds before you can even go because it will tell you launch, launch ready. Um, so that's whenever you have to go. Um, or that's when a good time to go, I should say. So it just takes a little bit more time. I mean, it feels really good going down the track. You know, I felt really straight. I hate to say it, but to me, it felt a little slow just because I do go almost 200 miles per hour. <laughs> right. So, but it was still fun, you know. So as somebody that is very used to uh, all of your senses being touched when you're, when you're racing, I mean, you've got the sound and the smell. Um, a lot of critics to electric vehicles say that you don't have soul in the car. Like you, you, just, you lack some of the connection. Did you find that to be true with the plaid? I mean, did, did you miss having the sounds and, and the smell of fuel burning? I feel like the sound and all that, it's part of the experience. Um, I guess it's a, it's a different feeling, though. Sure. Um, it is definitely quieter. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, there's not as much. I feel like there's not as much to do at the end once you cross the finish you just pretty much have to go on your break whereas you know in the gtr i have to put on my break i have to pull my parachute make sure i slow down <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's an important um, part but with the tesla you know it, you have that it's awesome off the line it is quiet but you do hear that worrying noise of the electric and like the dashboard does give you a little bit of you know graphics <laughs> yeah um but it, it has its own, I guess, your own soul of racing, I guess you would say, you know, sure. it's, you can't, it's, as my dad would always say, it's like comparing apples to oranges, uh, in a way, two totally different types of cars. Absolutely. It's just very easy to want to compare and contrast being that they're both doing the same thing. You're running down quarter mile in less than nine seconds, which is not something that most cars or most people never experience that in their lives ever. Um, right. One thing that I've said about Tesla in general, but more specifically about the plaid that I've been really impressed with is how they're making that kind of experience, that speed very accessible where to do yeah. that, I mean, I can only guess how much money that you guys have put into the GTR to keep that running, keep it in good shape, uh, tune it, make sure it has all the power. The Tesla is something that you don't necessarily, I mean, once you've bought the car, of course you need tires, but there's very little that you need in order to do what you did. That's true. It, it really is because you have no... You don't have to worry about transmission or an engine or anything like that. So <laughs> pretty much almost ready to go. Um, you kind of hit it there. <laughs> Do you guys have any plans for the future? I mean, any any uh, desire to want to try to make it go even quicker? Um, I mean, I feel like we would try. But I mean, right now we're pretty happy that we were the first, you know, first ones into the eights with the Tesla um, or production car, period, uh -huh. you know. Um, so I think maybe we would try doing something different, maybe in the summer next year or the year after. I honestly have no idea. Um, my husband is the, you know, he was the one who was, who has been trying, <laughs> um, to do it. Um, he actually took the P 100 D on hot rod drag week. It came in third place wow. in class. So, I mean, I feel like maybe he would take it to a drag week 
maybe mm -hmm. one time. Um, so, I mean, that could be something fun to see. I would happen. love to see how the plaid handles the full mile. Um, you know, I, I think that at the top, top it would, off, it would, right now, the, the top speed's limited to like 163, I think. Um, they're supposed to unlock at some point the full potential of 200 miles an hour with that car. So maybe after yeah. they've finally released that bit of software, um, it'll be something that maybe that'll be uh, uh, something to contend with for, you know, the four GTs and the other guys that are running some highly modified gas powered cars. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'll keep my fingers crossed. But if you guys do end up doing that, let me know, because I'd love to hear all about it. I'd like to see the roadster, you know, yeah. when the roadster comes out and uh, see what happens there. <laughs> that is going to be an absolute monster uh, when it finally comes. We've been waiting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Christine, I want to thank you for taking some time. I know you're you're busy with life, you know, and this was kind of kind yeah. of an impromptu thing, but I want to thank you for taking just a couple minutes to to talk about what something in the EV world. Um, it's very special. And when I heard about your record run, I had to, to talk to you. I had to find out more about it and, and really hear your side of the story. So I want to thank you for being able to, uh, to be with me and, and, and share that. Yeah, you're welcome. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your show for this week. Thank you so much for watching and listening. I do invite your feedback via email to hello at ev-resource.com. You can always leave a comment on the YouTube video and don't forget to subscribe. That way you'll get all the future shows delivered to you automatically. If you want to listen to any of the previous shows, you can find them on the webpage under the podcast section and on many of the major podcast platforms. So thank you so much for being with me and I'll catch you next week. <laughs>